Wow. It's time now for our meditation. So, if you will, make yourself comfortable. Maybe with feet flat on the floor. And if you're comfortable, close eyes. Feel yourself again enfolded in that divine golden white light. And open to knowing the truth of your being. Christ within you. I have been with you from the beginning of time. I shall continue to be with you throughout eternity. If you will but tune your ear to listen to me, you safely through every experience of life. No matter how many times you may have stumbled along the way, I have forgiven you and put you back on your feet. my love so that you may have a feeling of security. I am the loving Christ Spirit within you. Let me heal your mind and your body. Let me heal your heart when something troubles you. Turn your anxieties and your fears over to me. I will give you peace. Adjust all your reactions to life's experiences. You need not worry or fret. Go happily on your way. Accept me as the constant, loving presence with you. And I will not fail you. Learn of me. Trust me. I am the Christ within you. And so it is. Oh, you might take another nice breath. Begin to move those fingers and toes. Bring yourself back. To this time, this place, this room. And let your Christ light shine. You 
know, I never know exactly how this is going to show up <laughs> when, when, we, when we do these talks or lessons. And, and that's more what it is to me. I told Reverend Eileen this morning, my dream, my dream is to be able to stand up here and just have a conversation with you guys, a dialogue. I want to speak with you not at you or to you. And someday I'm going to get there. So f for now, we're just going to, have to, we're going to have to roll with it. Okay. That meditation this morning was a little different than I usually do. It's because I wanted us to have an experience of unity of 1972. That meditation was shared with us by May Rowland. Who knows who May Rowland is? Not very many people. Good, I can tell you. <laughs> May Rowland was, she was the director of Silent Unity for 55 years. As I see her, and I really took advantage of doing this talk to learn more about May because I first met her about 2016 when my church in Charlottesville was doing um, a, a talk that honored the women in unity, and I got to be May. And I got to wear this dress to be May, and I had a little white collar representative of the time of May. So I really wanted to, I wanted to know May. So May was born in 1890 in Kansas City, the same year the daily that Silent Unity was born. Isn't that cool? Her father, um, let me get his name here, David Hoagland, was one of the original Fillmore people, the group of 12 prayer partners that started this whole movement. So May was born and grew up in unity, which is phenomenal. Her dad was, um, he taught classes uh, with the Fillmores. And in 1905, when the Fillmores were ready to build on Tracy Street in Kansas City, they needed some money. David Hoagland mortgaged his home to provide the necessary funds to get that thing going. And in 10 years, the Fillmores had paid the, all of it back by 1915. So May was a lifelong student of the Fillmores with the Fillmores. She worked with Myrtle during high school uh, in Silent Unity. Shortly after she graduated high school in 1916, she became, Myrtle appointed her, director of Silent Unity. And I already told you, she was there for 55 years. Now, can you imagine those years between 1916 in 1971, when she retired. One world war was going on. Another, uh, uh, a depression came. Then there, was, uh, then there was another world war. May was there during all of that time. I see that as a major transitional time in the unity movement. And she and the Fillmore's son, Lowell Fillmore, were the rocks that were the spiritual leadership for the movement at that time. And it grew. So I just think that is so, so cool. In 1916, May had another red letter event. She got married. And she married Frank Whitney, who was the director of the Unity School of Correspondence. 
Whitney was the person responsible for the startup of Daily Word in 1924. And we know that this year we celebrate the 100th anniversary of Daily Word. I think July is the big, the big celebration month for that. So it, it's, just, it's just amazing to me all of the work that happened, all of the growth that happened. And during World War II, now we've heard about this before, but during World War II, they were getting lots of letters. Silent Unity was getting lots of letters from people who wanted prayers for their soldiers who were at battle, weren't at home. They just didn't know what was going on. So May approached James Dillett Freeman to say, could you write us a prayer, please? And the prayer for protection was born. See, all, May was instrumental in a lot of this. By all accounts, she was as pretty outside as she was inside. She had a steady, grounded personality. She lived the principles. She was an eloquent speaker. And as a matter of fact, she is one of the early ones who started traveling all over the world, talking about unity as it grew into different countries. She was in Europe and Japan, I know for sure. Uh, May may like to have fun too she she enjoyed life to the fullest she had flaming red hair i never knew that and until i was i was doing the research here and listening to a, a, a talk that one of my colleagues did flaming red hair and she loved to dance on friday night she was going to be at the local barn dance so her great gifts to unity were her organizational skills, her passion for affirmative prayer, and her faith. Now, she defines faith as the bridge across the inharmonious appearances of limitations to the place in consciousness where we know we are a child of God, free, whole, perfect. Now, it takes a while to kind of grok that definition, but you get it. Yeah, yeah. Now, the one thing you probably have heard about May was her tornado story. Okay, who's heard the tornado story? Okay, all right. I, you know, I thought everybody would have heard that by now. But it is worth repeating, and it comes from her book, Dare to Believe. She tells the story as she lived it. Now, as she is telling the story here, she has uh, just uh, gave a teaching about the scripture that says these words of Jesus. If you have faith as a grain of mustard seed, ye shall say to this mountain, Remove hence to yonder place, and it shall remove. And nothing shall be impossible unto you. Well, May goes on to say the most important word in that text is say. We are not just to think or even just to sit quietly and pray, but we are to speak the word of faith fearlessly as an active commanding prayer. So here's the story. One spring, there was a tornado in the vicinity of Unity School and in the vicinity of my home. The radio reported the direction in which it was moving. Those of, the, those of us at my home, oh, my home was in its direct path. I'll get it in a minute. And the tornado was headed our way at a speed of 50 miles an hour. Then the radio and the lights went out. We continued to pray and also to watch out of the windows of my house. 
In another few minutes, the formidable black monster with fire seeming to come out of it because of the glare of the red skies behind it and the flashing of the purple lights from the breaking power lines beneath it was practically upon us. In the great need and urge of the moment, I said to this oncoming monster, dissolve in the name of Jesus Christ. It was not just I that spoke. It seemed that I was the very mouthpiece of God speaking to this thunderous monster. And of course, not only was I praying, not only was I praying, but everyone at Unity School was praying. The result of the experience was that though we could feel the tremendous pull of the whirling wind of the tornado, it turned sharply and took another course. On its way, it continued to destroy, but in 10 minutes or less, when we went outdoors to see what had happened to it, there in the sky, it was turned into a thin white funnel, still holding its shape, but with its power gone. I say, that is an audacious story, a bold connection. You know, I debated whether I was going to tell you this other part or not. I never heard this until I was, again, doing the research. But some time later, May was at a social gathering, and a gentleman came up, having heard the story. Have you heard this? And said, so, what did you think after that? And she says, damn, this stuff works. <laughs> <laughs> There's another example of bold connection in the magic word, also by May. It's a chapter titled, Questions and Answers About Prayer. She's just answered the question about Mr. Fillmore. And by the way, he was always called Mr. Fillmore. Uh, in my early uh, Unity instructions, I had understood that he never, he chose never to be ordained. But then somewhere along the line, I heard that, yeah, he did. But he did not want to be called reverend. He was Mr. Fillmore. So that's why you see Mr. Fillmore in all the, all the older books. So, so she has just answered a question about Mr. Fillmore's prayer practice, saying that he spent three quarters of his time in prayer and meditation, night and day. Okay, so the next question. If Charles Fillmore prayed three-fourths of his time, it's amazing that he was able to do such a tremendous work. Do you think that most of the ideas for his teaching and writing came to him during these times of prayer and meditation? And she answers, yes, I am sure of it. I was in many classes conducted by Mr. Fillmore, Sometimes, as he answered the questions the students asked, it was as though he himself was not answering the questions. It was the Holy Spirit speaking through him. And she goes on to talk about that. And then the next question is, was Charles Fillmore truly inspired? And she answers, I asked Mr. Fillmore one time how he could write a book like Christian healing without revising or rewriting it. He said, well, I will tell you, May, it all came as a great inspiration. I wrote it down as it came. Was Mr. Fillmore's connection automatic writing? Was he channeling? Or did he just have a strong, intuitive wisdom? Regardless, he had a bold, direct line to divine inspiration.
I'm trying to remember which way I'm juggling these books right now. This was such an experience for me. I really feel like I know May, you know? So, and have I got the right book? Yes, I have the right book. Back to Dare to Believe. The second chapter is entitled, The Seekers of the Light are One. And what she says here is, we as seekers of the light are united in an invisible bond of love for all humanity. I hope you could feel that this morning as we meditated and we prayed. We have faith in mankind. We know that good shall be victorious and that nothing can defeat it. And she goes on to say about light, the light of man's spiritual nature can turn darkness into light. It can change a barren life into a productive life. Through prayer, this change is constantly occurring in the lives of individuals. We are living on a planet whose nature is light. Light is within us and all about us. We are truly children of light. Have you ever thought of yourself as a child of light? Well, I believe that we have had and are actually continue in the midst of a shift in consciousness since May penned these words in 1961, 63 years ago. The principle is unchanged. Spirit, consciousness, source, God, whatever you call it, principle has not changed. But our expression of it is amped up. I think we are more bringers of light. And Reverend Don, I believe, said last week, we're on the planet to be the light. As we get to know the truth of our being and who and what we really are, as we expand our awareness, our consciousness, we are here to be the light of the world just as Jesus taught us. He said it first. Okay. Now, the way I see that, in collective consciousness of our spiritual community, right here, we have become and are becoming more engaged in our expanded community, both within these walls and how we help each other our larger communities of Northport, Port Charlotte, Punta Garda, and beyond, we are boldly going where we've never gone before. We're reaching out. We're shining our light. May Rowland, I figured out as I did this, you know, she's the one who, who she must have coined this stuff works. They just left off the first word. And she also coined... Give it the light touch about prayer. So, now I see that differently now. Now, if you hear it this way, give it the light touch. Give it the light touch. See the difference? I just see it differently. We shine our light through our prayer, certainly. But you know, the greatest expression and experience of that light is when I can look into Grant's eyes and I see the Christ. And I look in Manuela's eyes and I see the Christ. It radiates. That's what the light is. Okay, I don't have a joke, <laughs> I, but I do want to tell you 
what I really wanted to talk about today. And I have asked that the Christ presence in the form of Lord Sananda or Jesus or Yeshua, however he wants to show himself to me in spirit today, I've asked him to be with me for this part because this is the important part for me, okay? The first thing I did when I got this title, Bold Connection, was to define what does bold mean to me. And according to Merriam-Webster, it means fearless before danger. Well, that would be courageous. Adventurous, audacious, and gutsy. Well, it can also be brash, foolhardy, hot-headed, cheeky. You get the picture. <laughs> and it's just like our 12 powers. Its expression can be seen on a spectrum from one extreme to another. From foolhardy to unadventurous, unenterprising, maybe not engaged. The ideal expression would be in a balance between the extremes, the sweet spot. That's the quiet boldness that I want to talk about. It's the gentle strength of the lion who lays with the lamb. That kind of boldness is powered. And I did not, I did not look ahead, guys. I did not realize today's word was strength. When I read that this morning, it was, yes. So that boldness is powered by inner strength. That power that we have to endure, to last, to be persistent, to stay the course, to be resilient and mentally tough. That's the power that lets us, once we've been inspired, and I'm talking about the prayer team and I'm probably gonna lose myself here, but once we've been inspired to provide this service, we feel a level of being called to share this with our spiritual travelers here. So we make that commitment, and then we get into prayer team training, and the rubber hits the road. We find that our ego steps in. It's a hard thing for us, and the way we do it, by the way, is with our spiritual practices, is to move that ego out of the way and to do what we came to do. So it is inner strength that lets us actually step into it and do it. And still, after we've had that training, and it's time now, we're going to go out here and we're going to pray with you. Yeah, right. That's when, that's when we get this, uh, as I see it, my, my human part tends to judge me. Reverend Donna asks us, she will, she will often ask whatever prayer chaplain is on duty to pray us in for services. And that's like, whoa. I've got to pray in front of the master, you know? Can I do this thing? I think we all feel that a bit. And then uh, when we, as this morning, some days when I come up here, I come prepared with a prayer. So I just kind of need that, that uh, what's the word I'm looking for? That cane, that, that something to hold on to. And sometimes I just say, let it flow. Well, this morning I was in the flow mood, but it's, it's always a little intimidating, just so you know. But we step up and we do it. And guess what? 
when we sit in that chair with that prayer stove on, or we pray us in here, or the real challenge that most of us have is picking up that phone once a month to call a fellow congregant who has asked to be called, by the way. But we don't always know this person. And it is, it takes a lot of praying up and preparing to do that. So I want you to know that when we call you to pray with you, We are being, we are trying to make a really bold connection for us. But guess what? That's what we signed up for. To be available, to offer to pray with others is called. When you think about it, we actually signed up to be put on the spot. In our Prayer team meetings, we meet once a month. And in our meetings, we pray one-on-one. We practice. We study. We pray aloud. And we take turns opening and closing prayers for each meeting. And we sing, too. We have a couple of people who really like to sing, and they are not bashful about leading us. So we have a lot of fun in the work that we do. And yes, we still might get weak in the knees when Reverend Donna asks us to pray on Sunday morning. But after that initial kind of shock, we kind of use every power at our disposal. We call on that inner strength. We call on will and understanding and faith. And we get aligned with our divinity. We summon our courage, and we boldly step up. We do it with zeal, with enthusiasm, with joy, powered by divine love. And the reason for this little thing is because I wanted to remind us that when we step up to do what we are called to do, to make the bold connection. We are superheroes. Okay? So that's what I wanted to share with you. Thank you for being here today and for listening. Yeah. Yeah. <sighs> it's time now for our blessing of gifts. So for those us, of us in the sanctuary, we can, we can take our gifts and we can and fill them with the love and the grace of spirit. For those at home, you can do the same thing and you express it by pressing that little clicking on that little donate button. And Unity Church of Peace is grateful for the support that we receive always going out to do the greater work in the world as we expand our consciousness. Anyway, affirm with me. Divine love through me blesses and multiplies all that I am, all that I have, all that I give, and all that I receive. Thank you, God, that this is so.